and uh, welcome to Navigation uh, grad uh, Graduate School Abroad, uh, Optics and Photonics Graduate Education in Germany. My name is Klaus Roll and I will be moderating this event on behalf of the Optical Society. I'm located in Germany, but presently doing this uh, present, uh, uh, event out of Paris. Before COVID, I was able to travel around Europe and meeting with people in person. I look forward to resuming that once the pandemic ends. Oops. Yes, and we are delighted to partner with the Max Planck School of Photonics and with the German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD, the German acronym. And it's our pleasure to have the following four panelists uh, with us. Uh, Professor, Professor Christine Silverhorn, head, head of the Integrated Quantum Optics Group at the Paderborn University in Germany, OSA Fellow 2019. Professor Karsten Rockstuhl, head of the Theoretical Nano Optics Group at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. He's OSA Fellow 2016. We also have Alejandra Zegara, PhD student at the Nano Imaging Group um, in, at the Leibniz Institute of Photonic Technology in Jena, where she was also a member of the local OSA student chapter. And finally, Peter Kerrigan, uh, Deputy Director of the New York Office of the DAD and Director of Marketing and Outreach. Each of each will speak for a few minutes, and then we have we will have a general question and answer session in a panel format. At the end, we will offer you uh, individual Zoom rooms with each speaker so that you can join them and uh, ask detailed questions. Uh, the beginning and everything will be recorded until when we switch into these individual question and answer sessions. I also would like to talk to you a bit about OSA and start with the core values, which we call I to the fourth, where we work to enable the connections in the community that lead to innovation. We show integrity by holding ourselves accountable and to high standards. We recognize that science must be diverse and inclusive, and we communicate the importance of the discoveries and technologies of optics and photonics. Here I will present a bit about the membership. You see it's we have approximately 23,000 members and we represent here the proportions of the different uh, types of members, which are individual members, student members, we have early career professional members and emeritus members. Of course, you can see the importance of the students in uh, at OSA and many of them are organized uh, also in student chapters. Uh, the, the next slide is about uh, the OSA public, publication program, where we offer 17 journals. Um, eight of our, 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 where we include eight, um, which are partner journals, and our flagship magazine, uh, Photonics News. Another important part at the OSA is the meetings and ex exhibitions, uh, where we convene uh, annually 23,000. Uh, and the more attendees at 43 different uh, events. Uh, these uh, events are from very huge com conferences like OFC, Clio, FIO, LS, uh, to smaller congresses, symposia and events with partners around the world. Um, yes, of course, this year, um, most of the, in, uh, the events have been virtual. And we also provide here some figures about the number of attendees we have, the technical papers produced out of these conferences, and also how many industry members of our industry program attend these meetings and exhibit. Um, then uh, the next part will, so uh, for the next part, we will show a very short video about the Max Planck School of Photonics, and then we'll go over to the panel, uh, the presentations and panel discussions. You can start asking questions for the panel discussion by clicking on the question and A answer button. This window will pop up where you can enter and submit your question. We will use them at the end uh, for the panel discussion. 
once this is over, we can go, you can go into, we will invite you just to join individual meeting rooms which each of, with each of the speakers where you can then ask detail, detailed questions. And so we hope you have really your find answers to all of your questions. So we can now go over to the video. The Max Planck School of Photonics is an interdisciplinary, two-phase PhD program for excellent physics and engineering students starting from bachelor level. What's so special about us? At first, our network of excellence. Our school consists of 48 fellows working at 16 universities and research institutes located all over Germany. Thus, the school's faculty unites all excellent scientists and their research expertise throughout Germany try to find this in one single location. If we combine the research activities of all our fellows, we even surpass the Ivy League. Amongst our fellows, we have winners of the Nobel Prize, Otto Hahn Prize, the German Zukunft Prize, and many more. By joining our school, you'll have access to these brilliant scientists and their highly renowned research institutions. The fellows train you during your two-year study phase and offer scientific exchange and supervision for your PhD project in the three-year research phase. At any time during the program, you can focus completely on your training, since we support you with generous scholarships and positions. Choose between three locations for your study phase and get your integrated master's degree in an inspiring, international atmosphere. To prepare you for your career as a photonic innovator, our school offers cross-locational teaching. With innovative concepts in digital teaching, we constantly train and interconnect our network. During our annual events and summer schools, we foster scientific exchange and technical skills. Become part of Germany's leading international photonics education program with full financial support for graduate and doctoral students. We have no tuition fees and all of our courses are taught in English. We offer a network of excellence with world-renowned fellows. In our school, you'll find exclusive career opportunities in Germany's photonics academia and industry. So, if you have a passion for science as we do, don't miss our next application phase starting this autumn and join the Max Planck School of Photonics. To learn more about our program, please visit www.photonics.school I would like to present or ask now uh, of the next presentation will be done by Christine Silverhorn and uh, so uh, the floor is yours now. Okay, I hope you can see and hear me now okay it's my pleasure actually to also uh, introduce you to uh, this uh, <clears throat> sorry for a phd program in germany let me first introduce myself as it was already said my name is christina silverhorn i'm fellow of the max planck school and i'm professor at paderborn university so if you come to germany to do your phd you will join a research team and in this team, you will do research with all the other scientists. What you see on this slide already is one of the devices which we fabricate and use for the applications in Paderborn. Before I start to go more into detail in the research, I would like to show you a little bit where Paderborn is. I guess many of you have never heard about that city, but actually it's a quite standard German historic place where you see that we have a nice environment. This is the cathedral of Paderborn. We have the shortest river in Germany and this is the historic town hall. Now the reason why we are located there is because we have a long tradition there in Europe for fabricating non-linear waveguides. The materials which we are using is lithium niobate and potassium titanous phosphate where we basically fabricate the waveguides and then also do the periodic polling. What do we do with them? Well, the research area I'm working at is quantum technology. You might have heard about that. So what is quantum technologies? Quantum technologies is actually the science where we try to exploit quantum physics 
for today's technologies. Now, if you look into today's technology, particularly if you're coming from optics, a lot of other technologies we're using nowadays, like lasers, but also transistors, semiconductor devices, and so on, is based on quantum mechanics. And we call that quantum technologies of the first generation. Nevertheless, we want to go further and we want to explore, exploit, explore the quantum technologies of the second generation. What is that? We want to harness genuine quantum properties of individual quantum systems, for example, single photons, but also single atoms or quantum dots to really build up a new technology. And this is kind of one of the visions. We want to have a chip with different functionalities and quantum experiments on that and fabricate those. Now, what is that more in detail? Well, it's linear optical quantum computation, it's quantum walks and quantum simulations, it's quantum communication systems and quantum metrology. And I guess you might have heard at your un universities about these different science areas. What the goal of the research line is, is a realization of complex, but yet practical photonic quantum systems. Now, this is basically how a lab looks from the inside. And actually we also have these labs. These is a standard quantum optics labs where we can do quite complicated experiments. But if you really want to use them in practical life and for future technologies, this is not how you can handle experiments easily. So if you want to take it outside the lab, you have to build up devices. And this is one of the devices in our lab. And this is actually what we're building up in our facilities. Now, if you come to Europe, you will be not only part well, of a school itself, but actually you will be embedded in a research community. And the research community is not only the German research community, but we also have very strong European programs. And you might have heard about the European Quantum Flagship Program for quantum technologies. This flagship program has different research areas called pillars, pillars, quantum communication, quantum computation, simulation and sensing, as well as basic science. And here the European Union really puts quite a lot of money into that to really establish these new technologies. Now, the nice thing about quantum photonics is like classical photonics, photonics is an enabling technology. And here in this sense, you can do science across all these pillars. And this is giving quite interesting opportunities. In, the, in my group, we are actually part of different European networks and projects, which you can see here, like Unicorn, FOC, APRISF, KISH, and stormy tune. And this is actually important because this makes sure that the group you're working is in an international group. These projects establish strong European links to all kinds of different partners, uh, ranging from Oxford to Paris and so on. Now, let me show a little bit more into detail how such an integrated quantum of the, how our integrated quantum optics group work. We have on the one hand, really the technology. What that means, we really have clean room facilities and as a PhD student, you can go there and fabricate the own devices. These devices or waveguides which we use, bring, we bring them then to the optics labs where we really uh, look for the functionality and see that the devices are really operating like we want and we can develop these devices you saw beforehand. And we actually give the design to the technology. Last but not least, there is a network subgroup and this network subgroups really comes from the concept of quantum technologies, like quantum simulation uh, applications and ultra fast quantum systems. And they basically give us the design rules and altogether you see that it's a circle. And I think this is one of the fascinating things here that you can do all kinds of different pieces what you need to establish such a technology. Now, why have I told you all that? Well, I think the most important thing is that we are working in a team. If you're coming to one of the university groups, here you see my group, it's a strong team where all different people, scientists at all different career stages work together. And this is actually fun. There's the group leaders, but there's also postdoctoral researchers, their fellow PhD students, and their young students who are actually also working already in the group. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope for your questions later on. Thank you very much. As a next speaker, I would like now to hand over to Professor Carsten Robstuhl, who will talk about the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Uh, 
Yeah, close. So, yeah. okay, so I, I, I must say that uh, I, okay, I just start my, my, my video transmits here. Uh, it looks like I'm not sure how stable my transmission is. So some of the voices I, I just heard like, uh, like fractional, but I try to do my best that uh, everything uh, turns out smooth. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everybody also to, to my side. And uh, as I already said, so my name is Carsten Rockstuhl uh, and I'm gonna, going to tell you today something about optics and photonics, graduate education um, in, in Germany in general. But of course, I, I tell this to you from the perspective of Karlsruhe, uh, which is one of the, the main places to study uh, optics and photonics. Um, as you already see, there are, let's say, multiple involvement also in different types of graduate schools. So we have this Karlsruhe School of Optics and Photonics, which is a local graduate school, uh, but I'm also involved in this Max Planck School of Photonics, which is a German-wide uh, graduate school uh, that concentrates on the education of optics and photonics. Um, so Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, just to introduce this also shortly, is a kind of special entity in the German academic landscape um, because it's a merger of a university and a national research laboratory. And uh, that makes it quite unique. And in that sense, we have both of these aspects in our, our place here. So both really education and research uh, on these different scales. Um, so we are located in the Western part of Germany, close to the French border actually. And uh, as you see here in this button picture, and so the, the sort of speciality or is also reflected in the catchphrase that we try to use to identify our university. Uh, and that is the research university in the Helmholtz Association, uh, which, uh, which we are. Um, so maybe just, just to give you a bit of a, of a measure also. So KIT has in the order of 25,000 students. It's a, a budget in the order of a billion euro. Um, it has 3,000 PhD students and in the order of 350 professors. Um, so the main research themes at which we focus in general here at KIT uh, revolve around the central ideas of energy, mobility, and information. And you can easily imagine that optics and photonics is a key ingredient to all of these three different research fields. Yeah? Um, so as energy, it's easy to, uh, to, to imagine. So you have like solar energy or light emitting diets. Um, that uh, drive uh, green photonics revolution. Uh, so mobility, you have autonomous driving um, where cars are basically fully equipped with all kinds of optical sensors uh, to generate an, an image of our, our outer world. Uh, and also information, of course, is, is essentially relying on optical integrated technology uh, also along the lines as uh, Christine Silberhorn basically has just been explaining to you. Um, so coming more to the local, aspect. So this Karlsruhe School of Optics and Photonics um, is a graduate school that covers both education at the master level and at the PhD level. And you could come to us to do a master yeah, uh, that lasts then for two years. And uh, But you could also come directly to us uh, as a part of the PhD program, um, which lasts usually in the order of three years. Uh, but of course, this is not always such easy, predictable, and it also takes a bit longer. Um, so besides the actual education, of course, uh, there are many uh, additional elements that uh, form a part of this graduate school. Um, and uh, for example, we have also further education like an MBA fundamentals program that we offer to our students. Um, so the school itself is organized into five different research areas. Um, so one of them revolves around photonic materials and devices. Um, a second one about quantum optics and spectroscopy. Uh, a third one about biomedical photonics. Uh, and the fourth about optical systems and the fifth about solar energy. Um, so once you have been graduating from us, um, so half of our alumni basically go to industry uh, and another half goes to, uh, to research places all over the world and continue their, their academic uh, explorations. Um, so just to, to give you a little bit of an overview of what uh, scientific subjects the school is doing in general also. So uh, for example, we do this laser nanoprinting with 3D additive manufacturing technology, um, which uh, Karlsruhe particular is quite famous for uh, because it uh, has been also the place where the world leader uh, Nanoscribe that uh, provides the technology for doing the 3D laser nanoprinting uh, had been founded like 15 uh, years ago or so. Uh, but we also are very active in, in high-speed optical data communication um, or uh, this autonomous driving I already mentioned. Yeah. So just to give you a kind of, of, of numbers also for the size which we are speaking here about. Um, so currently we have in the order of 150, 160 master students. Um, we have 75 uh, PhD students. Um, we have more than 450 master alumni 
uh, and uh, above 200 uh, PhD alumni. So uh, in the course of the time, the case of had been generating more than 100, uh, 1,800 publications. Uh, and we are particularly proud also of our 10 spin-offs that we have been generating. Um, so as uh, was already mentioned also, so this Max Planck School of Photonics is a, a, a German-wide graduate school uh, with an integrated five-year program where that starts with a study phase and also continues then with a research phase. Uh, but of course, once you have a master degree, uh, you could also come to us actually and enter directly at this research phase. And uh, maybe just to mention, so the people that are in Karlsruhe that are involved in this Max Planck School of Photonics, um, are Uli Nienhaus doing optical microscopy, um, David Hunger doing work on optical micro cavities, um, so Christian Koos on integrated photonics, uh, Uli Lemmer on printable semiconductors, uh, Martin Wegener on 3D laser nanotelegraphy, uh, and myself on theoretical nanophotonics. Um, so this is also then already so the last slide of my, my presentation here. I just would like to give you also a short overview on the, the type of research activities we do. So we are having a group here on theoretical nano optics um, and that this covers basically many different aspects. So we start with like classical scattering theory uh, where we ask ourselves how particular symmetries of an object um, so translate to observable properties uh, when light interacts with these structures. Uh, but we are also heavily involved in, in quantum optical activities uh, where comparable to the activities also from Christine Silberhorn that is mostly revolves around the uh, integrated quantum optical circuits. Uh, but we are also very active in quantum metrology, so quantum sensing. Um, so where we ask ourselves, so how quantum resources could improve um, various measurement schemes. Um, so a third uh, major topic is also the design of photonic materials. Uh, that is a subject that has been attracting in the recent years quite a lot of attention, um, particular with the development of methodologies that come from the field of artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, we explore uh, these opportunities um, to uh, design photonic materials such that they serve specific purposes. Um, but in my group, we also have, uh, let's say, scale bridging modeling activities in place um, where we have quantum chemists actually that study molecular properties or optical properties of molecular materials from first principles. Uh, and we try to fuel them into optical simulations that take place on much larger length scales. Um, and the kind of system that one can investigate there um, is uh, for example, here the, the emission of uh, photoluminescence from molecules that are placed in, in junctions um, where like a metallic ground plate is brought in very close contact uh, with a, a metallic tip, yeah? Um, and this is a kind of broad overview of the things we are doing. Um, and uh, if you have then questions on any of these aspects, <clears throat> um, I'm very happy to take them at a later stage uh, of this session here. I hope this went nice. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, I would now like to uh, to hand over to Alejandra Segara. Um, we have invited her to present her own experience coming from out of Europe into Europe and talk about a bit, yeah, a bit about this experience. So here we will play a video because Alejandra had some technical issues and so we, there will be the video. Good afternoon and good morning. I am Alejandra and I am currently doing my PhD, developing a fast and efficient Raman microscope in the microscopy department of the Leibniz Institute of Photonics Technology in Vienna, Germany. Today, I am not going to speak about my research, but my experience living abroad as an international student and researcher. I left my country eight years ago. Therefore, I spent most of my adult life abroad which meant for me many rich and unique experiences that I decided to call my world life trip. I started, of course, in Peru, my motherland. You probably know about the wonderful Machu Picchu in the highlands, but Peru also has rainforests and jungles. Here you have the Amazon River and a large coast. I come from this city next to the Pacific Ocean called Lima. Peru is an emerging country full of history and natural resources but also with so many political corruption related troubles. And these troubles have a huge impact on core sectors as education. 
getting a university position can be very, very challenging in certain universities in my country. Challenging, but not impossible, so I did. I got a position at the National University of Engineering, there I study physics engineering. While the theoretical background of the university is very strong, the technological resources are very limited. And this is because of the low state budget for science and education. But this does not let us down. The students from UNI use this as an opportunity to push the creativity to the limits to solve problems and develop instruments. For example, we founded an OSA student chapter. This organization sent us an adult budget, and with this, we could participate with optical experiments in science fairs and organize optical workshops for students. Another example is that during my bachelor thesis, I built the first Raman spectroscope of Peru. It was based on low cost equipment as self made frames. After my bachelor's, I got the chance to travel to the USA for a research stage in Portland State University. It is located in Oregon, a step next to the North Pacific Ocean. There, I had the chance to deal with advanced optical techniques and instruments for the very first time in my life. Then the short research stage become longer. And while the resources were good in the USA, Emotionally, it was a very difficult period for me. I found an environment of dishonest, strong competition that challenged my ethical and moral values. Since the research contract was good, it was difficult to accept that I was not happy there. This, together with the strong racism against Latin Americans, the difficulty to making friends there and being far away from my family, made me decide to leave. For the first time in my life, I did not know what I was going to do next. I couldn't figure it out a plan. Until those final weeks there, I had the chance to attend a talk given by Eric Bexic mm -hmm. about high resolution light sheet microscopy. And after seeing those amazing images of molecules and embryos, I knew that what I wanted to do is to combine those light sheet microscopy techniques with my core Raman spectroscopy. That idea was my motivation to continue in science. I was lucky because my search was very narrow. There were not so many groups in the world doing that. And one of those few groups were the Heisman lab that is located in Vienna, Germany. I made some research about Vienna and I found out that this place is where Ernst Abbe developed the basic concepts of light microscopy that we use now. And Carl Zeiss founded the optic, optics technology world leading company and also, I found out about the university with so much history and tradition. Schiller and Goethe were there. And all of this happening in a charming little valley city called it Jena, the city of light. Everything seemed like destiny for me. But of course, there was the time and economical limits. Time, because to enter to the doctoral studies in Germany, a master's degree is necessary and economical because even though the university education is free, there are living costs that uh, are very expensive for a Peruvian family. Anyway, I decided to give it a try and then apply to the Abbe School of Photonics where I got not only a position, but also a scholarship from the government of Thuringia. So everything was settled. And there was when my longest and more amazing adventure started. Those two years were the most intercultural experience I ever had. We were a class of 40 students coming from different continents, having the chance to learn from the famous photonics expertise people, people that I already knew because of their awesome papers. I feel extremely fortunate to come here as a part of an international program. We had extraordinary program coordinators that were entirely compromised to help us. They took incredibly good care of us since the basic stuff that every foreigner student has to face, like opening a bank account or getting insurance, to organizing nice activities to integrate us with other students to keep us happy. We never fell alone. We had student parties, some hiking trips, and some industry fair trips, and finally, a nice graduation ceremony. I also found an OSA student chapter in the Uni Jena, so I joined them to continue diffusing the interest of optics among students. 
I managed to do my master thesis in the group of Professor Heinzmann, and afterwards he offered me a PhD position to continue the project that combines Raman spectroscopy with light sheet microscopy. And here is where I am now. I am living in Jena for more than five years, and my perception of Germany has changed over time. Here I found a second family. Most of my adult life friends are here, and I got a Turingian boyfriend. Finally, working in Germany also allowed me to take my knowledge back to my country. Last year, we organized a holographic microscope workshop for kids in the highlands of Peru. This would not have happened without the strong support to research and education that Germany provides to the students. Thank you very much. And now I would like to hand over to Peter Kerrigan from New York uh, in, uh, for the DAAD, who will talk about uh, some questions that students will ask before going to Germany, probably. Thank you. Let me just, excuse me. Um, all right, thank you so much. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, great. Thank you so much for the invitation, uh, for the opportunity to talk to you uh, today about pursuing a PhD in Germany. We've heard some amazing examples of research groups. And of course, the, the most recent um, testimonial from Alejandra is phenomenal, I think, in, in providing an overview and, or a taste of what it would be like to pursue um, a PhD in Germany. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Peter Kerrigan. I'm the um, Deputy Director of the German Academic Exchange Service, GED's North American office based here in New York City, and also the Director of uh, Marketing and Outreach for DAD uh, in Canada and the US. Um, I think I just I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the higher education landscape, talk a bit about um, the different kinds of PhDs. We've heard specific examples from my colleagues before uh, the mic, the virtual mic was passed to me. And then touch upon it also a very important point, of course, is funding, uh, which all of us think about. I think what's important to point out, and that's been illustrated, I think, quite well, is why Germany? Let's start with the basic question, because many of you are sitting in kitchens like me around the world. So why would you want to put Germany in your future and or on your resume? Um, I think when looking at the higher education landscape, it's important to note, as has been pointed out, how international it really is. So roughly 11.2% of all students matriculated at a German university do not hold a German passport. And I think most people don't think of that level of diversity when they think of Germany, but it is in fact a very, very diverse country. And also important, since we're talking about the PhD level, is that about 28,000 international students are matriculated in a PhD program in Germany right now. I think also to, to, to point out, and I think the examples illustrate this, are um, just how dynamic the research is in Germany, um, how interdisciplinary the, the research is, and also the funding. We're not going to go into great detail, but suffice to say that there's an enormous amount of funding coming from the various ministries in Germany behind research in Germany to a level which is relatively unmatched around the world. As has been pointed out, you can pursue your PhD in English. It does not mean you should not learn German if you're there studying uh, your degree in, 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 in English, but you can pursue a PhD without knowing the German language. Um, and as has been mentioned, there are no tuition fees. And of course, for somebody coming from my end, end of the academic world, that's unheard of. Um, but it really, of course, one should say the German taxpayer is footing the bill. But at the end of the day, there are other costs um, with living in Germany, of course, and, and, and uh, costs around that, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I think I'll end that, the sort of the, the why Germany sales pitch with life is good in Germany. The, the quality of life, the standard of living, both of which are really quite, quite high uh, in relation to other countries around the world. And, you know, let's not forget the, pan the elephant in the middle of the room right now. Um, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and I think certainly from my side of the Atlantic, Germany has enjoyed a very, very good reputation in terms of, of how it's navigated uh, the COVID crisis. And I think we need to keep that in mind, certainly in the immediate future. 
So a little more to the different types of PhDs, you've, you've been quoted examples. Uh, very, 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 very generally, there are what are called individual PhDs and the more structured PhD. And, you know, I think maybe in the breakout rooms or as we, you move forward with your research, you can decide which is a better fit for you. But the individual PhD is, as the name implies, that you are pursuing individual research. You're working very closely with someone who's called the, the Dr. Mutter or the Dr. Fata uh, in terms of you know, who is gonna be that person who is accompanying you individually on that research journey. Uh, the structured PhD is, as the name implies, structured in the sense that you are probably gonna be part of a larger research group. And it, with that, you may also have a, an established curriculum. There might be coursework involved, there might be exams involved, but it is much more structured in the, in the sense that you might encounter in countries like Australia, Canada, the US, uh, Great Britain, et cetera. So there really, it depends on what works for you. And of course, where is the relevant research uh, that you want to do? Which of these two paths makes sense for you? And of course, with that, there's funding involved. And we've heard it already an example of where funding was secured. There's funding for the individual and there's funding for the project slash and or research group, depending upon the path that you're gonna take. I'm not gonna go into great detail right now, but we can of course explore this together in the breakout rooms. But I just wanted to put this slide up there just to let you know there is a lot of funding available, regardless of the path that you're going to take. Some of that funding is of course uh, tied into the Institute uh, let's say a, Lab, a Leibniz Institute or Max Planck or Fraunhofer, who is, who is providing you with that research slash PhD opportunity. But some of it is more generic and can be applied for different opportunities. But again, duration, the type of funding and the type of PhD path you choose to take, um, there is money to back up your decision. Just also want to point out um, some in incredible uh, websites. And I think if you're gonna remember one, I would say researcher in Germany is the, the best one because that is the A to Z on, on how to, to really pursue and conduct research in Germany. Everything from cost of living um, to what if I wanna bring a spouse and or a child with me? Where are the research groups, et cetera? Garrett um, below, uh, the, there is no immediate association with that name, but it really is a, a fantastic database of the research going on, the research groups in Germany right now, which might help you identify and narrow the search that you will take once you decide how you want to and what kind of PhD you want to pursue. And your access, I think we should point out, there is funding at the European level, and that funding can be secured not only to conduct research in Germany, which is what we're talking about right now, but of course, if you decide you do want to pursue research elsewhere in the EU. So um, I, with that, I'll just, I'll just say thank you for now. Uh, the DED website that I've put on in front of you is our, um, the website for our headquarters in Bonn in Germany. And that is a worldwide website, DAD.DE. For those of you who are, who are tuning in here from the US or Canada, if you just add the .org at the end, DAD.org, that is the website for the US and Canada. But again, research in Germany really is probably the first stop, um, the first step I would recommend for all of you. So for that, I'll, I'll pass the mic back on to, to Klaus and thank you so much. So, thank you. Um, the first questions are coming in and so I think uh, the best is I just start uh, in the order they are coming. Um, we had one question from Rizwan Solvi. Um, I'm currently doing my integrated five-year graduate undergraduate program in photonics in India, but I'm so interested in doing research in Max Planck Institute. I plan to do to join your master's program after my sixth semester. What are my chances to enter these universities? Is there an answer? Uh, 
Okay, maybe maybe, maybe I, I just uh, shortly try to uh, to give an answer, at least from my perspective. So the, the entrance qualification that we have for most of our master programs is a bachelor degree. And that is a degree that you would get after six uh, semesters of, uh, of, of a course. So uh, th that, that is a kind of formal type of requirement. So I don't know whether you have a, a certificate or a document that you can receive after six, uh, six semesters. That would uh, be a kind of equivalence to the uh, to a kind of bachelor degree. So this this is something I don't know. If you don't have a degree at all, then it, it looks a bit complicated. But uh, this is something that one uh, one has to discuss on some sort of bilateral case. So maybe it's possible to generate some sort of document that states this equivalence. Yeah. But in principle, we have an entrance qualification, and this is a bachelor degree. Okay, maybe the next question then, uh, again from India. Uh, I am a Master of Science Photonics students in India. I want to know how Max Planck School of Photonics helps the students to enter the industrial sector after a PhD. I want to apply for a PhD and thus wanted to know opportunities in industry. Well, maybe I can give an answer to that. So um, if you do your PhD, there you have a close contact to your supervisor and to other fellow PhD students. Now, most of our PhD students are actually not educated for academia, but for industry. And there could well be that networks are established through people who have also graduated and these things. So I think there are possibilities and maybe Julia Hengster from Max Planck could also answer. There's also structured ways but a lot of things actually work on an informal basis because German industry, and I think this is what you should know, is highly interested in people who have done a PhD in physics. Yeah, I can maybe quickly step in. So hi, my name is Julia Hengster and I'm uh, one of the coordinators from the Max Planck School. And um, so basically to cover this gap between the uh, university education um, to the step over to industry, um, we have, uh, for example, a specific event uh, called the Photonics Days, uh, Jena, which are um, uh, made especially for getting connections uh, to the industry, um, so optics and photonics industry in Germany. And um, there will be, a, or it's usually a career fair where you can get um, first connections um, to HR departments or uh, people um, working there in the R&D uh, sectors. And um, yeah, as well, uh, we have in our summer schools and autumn schools um, some special courses uh, like um, uh, which skills uh, you need um, or career planning um, on, on which uh, skills you should uh, work on during your PhD to enable um, a smooth uh, transfer to industry afterwards. So I hope this helps you a bit. Okay, another question, this time from, um, oops, disappeared, from Pakistan. I have sub submitted my PhD thesis in Pakistan. What are the op opportunities for postdocs? My research area is 2D materials in quantum optics. Yeah, so the uh, I'm, I'm not sure maybe maybe this uh, maybe maybe Christine can also answer so but uh, okay this this is not not easy to answer I mean I cannot give you the here here addresses uh, to which you have to apply uh, but uh, let me assure you that uh, nearly all of the scientific disciplines and the subjects are represented by uh, by research groups in Germany and uh, I think uh, the best way is just you have to look on the web pages you have to find them out. If you have done a PhD, I think uh, I would I would guess that you have a good overview of the, the scientific players in the field, and then you have to approach them. Yeah, so you have to uh, to look either for job announcement or what is also not so uncommon actually is just uh, write a kind email to the people that are working in this field and just ask whether they have an, an open position available for somebody. Yeah, so in, in principle, my experience is people are always looking for young scientists. Yeah, um, they look for good young scientists. This is also something that one always has to say. Uh, but uh, in general, there are positions available, and uh, I think you just have to uh, to approach the right persons. But this is really this is a bilateral thing. Yeah. Um, 
I think th there is a similar question to, to, to which the same apply, uh, answers apply. Uh, I uh, pursuing I Gustav pursuing PhD in photonics. Is there any opportunity for doing postdoc after completing my PhD in this institute? So I think it's exactly the same. Yeah, so it's the same. So mm -hmm. so maybe 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 one advice uh, that that one can give in general. So the German universities are not necessarily made for let's say long-term postdoc positions. So uh, the, the, I mean, the university in Germany is still an education and we educate PhD students and there are a few postdoc positions, but I think there are more PhD positions. So if you're looking for a postdoc position, then it's much better to look for these institutes like Max Planck or Helmholtz or Fraunhofer or Leibniz. So there, I think a much larger number of uh, scientists after the PhD positions are hired. And these are the places usually where most of the postdocs are going. Yeah. So of course, there are also postdocs at universities. And uh, I myself have actually quite a lot in my group, uh, but, uh, this is this is this is not the uh, the usual or this, this is a bit uh, yeah so there are more PhD students put it like this yeah maybe maybe I can add something to that um, not long term postdocs but we have quite a few postdocs for the um, two years after the PhD and I would advise you go to all access because there's the research projects in and there might be job advertisement uh, adver advertisements you saw that also on the presentation of the DAD that might be a good idea. <laughs> Uh, I have a question from Venezuela now. Um, what are the chances and the steps to follow for someone who is studying chemistry as undergraduate and want to apply for the master's in photonics, especially in laser sources and applications? Yeah, so so for example, this is, uh, this. I mean, I, I think there, this is quite good, yeah. So, I mean, I can answer this from the perspective of Karlsruhe. So we have this Karlsruhe School of Optics and Photonics, and this is a quite interdisciplinary graduate school. And indeed also people from the chemistry are involved in this group, yeah. So they, they, they work exactly on these topics that you have been mentioning, yeah. So they do a lot of uh, spectroscopy, so ultra fast spectroscopy, they do the associated laser development, but of course they also apply them to do a, to do spectroscopy and characterization. So we also have a lot of chemical partners actually in this context of 3D additive manufacturing. So that uh, we need chemists that provide the molecular inks that are written at a later stage. And um, there are gigantic activities in Karlsruhe. So I might have mentioned, so as a part of the excellence initiative. So we have one of these excellence clusters running here. Uh, which is called 3D Meta Made to Order. So there are in the order of like 100 scientists or so 150 scientists work for seven years about these subjects. And one third of them actually is devoted to molecular materials. Yeah. So and uh, all these people there, they, uh, they provide education, they need uh, PhD students, and they also need postdocs. So and then, then you come really with a chemical background to them. Yeah. Another question um, from an Indian Institute of Science and Education uh, and uh, Education and Research in Kolkata. The courses at my institute are targeted mostly in condensed matter and high energy physics, with a few courses focused on at optics. I'm interested in quantum optics research, thus I'd like to check the master level courses being offered in the study phase, as it would help me decide if I should pursue masters or directly apply for a PhD. Uh, the question is a bit longer, I think, but uh, I think it, it's already a good start. Well, I don't know, Carsten, if you want to... Quantum optics is, is of course, my field. Um, now, Paderborn University doesn't offer the master's courses. Um, nevertheless, maybe I can comment for Erlangen because I'm familiar with that. Um, what I would advise you, just go to the web pages of the universities and check uh, there what material is available. I'm pretty sure I know the researchers there that there's quite a lot of quantum optics <laughs> which you can take there. And maybe for PAT, uh, Carsten can comment, but I'm very sure that you will find appropriate courses there. Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe uh, I, would, I would like to make a, a bit of a, of, a, of a twofold answer. So if you come to the study phase, yeah, so I think in general, it's not required that you have been exposed actually to optics lectures because you're gonna, going to be educated on optics in, in our, at, at, the, at the study phase. So uh, people come to this uh, yeah, with, uh, with a chemistry, with a biology, with an electrical engineering, with a physics background, and this is pretty much diverse. 
uh, but of course they have to be excellent, but then they can enter this education and then uh, we start, for example, with some, some adjustment modules where we equilibrate basically everybody in this background knowledge and then we educate on the aspects of optics and photonics. So if you have not done optics and photonics into your bachelor, this is not a problem to enter the study phase. But to enter this research phase as a PhD student, this is probably a bit more, more difficult. Um, but nevertheless, we can always motivate you to apply for, uh, but you have to keep in mind that you will be compared to other applicants uh, that probably have a much stronger education than in this uh, field of science that we are looking for. So, uh, I mean, if you're exceptional in other fields and if you bring in expertise and skills that are urgently needed, then everything can be compensated. But uh, otherwise, you, I think you have to keep in mind that uh, people that are excellently educated in optics apply also for these positions. And then the people, this is something that I think one, one, one should say also clearly have the tendency, of course, to take those people that are already educated in the subjects that matter. But um, again, this is a case to case decision. Yeah. So there's no uh, checklist that we go through. Yeah? Another question is a bit more about the obligations in, in, for, in this PhD program. Are there obligations with regards to number of conferences uh, attended, journal publications, uh, exams, or courses to be followed? Maybe I can start answering. Um, this is mostly for the individual, but I think it's true for the whole German education. So basically in Germany, you finish your master's and then you start your PhD. Now your PhD is not considered as a real studying time, but it's really, you're considered already as a junior researcher. And your supervisor is the person who really wants to help you and is actually there and you do research with him. And the idea is to educate that to really an independent researcher at the end. But the education expects, is expected that you have done it beforehand already. So there is nothing, nothing like where you have additional exams there are normally not many formal requirements. Having said that, so <laughs> your supervisor uh, decides when you're ready to some extent and you have to present it to the faculty. And I think most supervisor will require that you have done some publications. And most supervisor would really also say that differently, want you to present your work at international conferences because that shows that you're ready to be an independent researcher. It's a little bit of an answer which um, highlights what the PhD is in Germany because I have experienced, I've been working with a lot of international students that sometimes they're quite surprised because there is not so much structure, at least in these individual PhDs. But actually I can tell you that the German PhD students uh, enjoy that a lot because it also gives you a lot of room for personal development. Having said that, nowadays almost all universities have something like a credit school which is supporting soft skill courses and all kind of additional skills which you will be offered courses, but many of them are not obligatory. Now I leave the structured PhD to Carsten because I think you're much more into that. Um, we are mostly doing the individual PhD. Yeah, but I think there's not much to say. So also even thought, I mean, even, even the PhD program is structured. At the end of the day, you do not submit your thesis to the uh, to the graduate school, but to the faculty, and they have to accept or not to accept this. And um, there is a, a final PhD defense, so this is an examination, and this is not necessarily always very tight on the subject of the thesis. Um, so there, you can also ask, let's say, broader aspects, and that's the the only type of examination that you're gonna going to face. And otherwise, I think uh, Christina just said it very precisely. So. Uh, what is required in terms of publications or conference participation? This is up to you and up to the uh, not up to you, uh, but up to the to your discussion with your supervisor. Yeah. So uh, what is his expectations? And uh, there's no uh, no common rule. So also just keep in mind. I mean, you may have one really brilliant uh, publication, and that is worthwhile the Nobel Prize. And then it would be hard to to not giving you the PhD thesis at our university for this. So. Uh, it's, it's the content that matters at the very end. Yeah? And uh, that content need to be defended towards the faculty and uh, your supervisor at the end of the day also has to agree that this is a good thesis and that can be submitted and that can be defended. Yeah? Maybe I would like to add something. There's some obligation from the Max Planck School, <laughs> which we have, uh, that we attend these things, but these obligations are really good for you, I would say, because it gives you a lot of 
training. And I don't know if Alessandra wants to add something, but I think that would be great to hear the students, how you experience that. I personally can only convey that I think that students like it, but I, I think it's good to give a voice there to, the, to somebody who has really experienced it. Yeah, sure. In, in, my, in the university, in the Uni Jena, it depends on the faculty. In the Leibniz Institute of Photonics Technology, we have 50-50, uh, I would say 50 students coming from the chemistry faculty and 50 from the physics faculty, and the requirements are completely different. The chemistry faculty asks for, uh, for example, three publications and uh, also uh, to go to some lectures, but the physics faculty, it's not asking for papers. And on the other hand, they are asking for to attend one uh, subject that is not related to the actual field. And additionally, uh, professors, as you uh, le let it know, they can put additional uh, requirements, but basically is what the faculty wants and everything depends on them. Okay, I have another question about um, uh, the start of, um, no, not the start, but the ideal application time. Is there an, an ideal application time or are there programs starting all over the year or do, what is exactly the situation? So this Max Planck School of Photonics, this has a certain application deadline. Yeah? Maybe Julia can write this somewhere in the chat, so I, I, I do not see this, but uh, this is somewhere towards middle of December. Yeah, and then uh, I think, yeah, you simply have to apply at this deadline. So also, okay, but uh, this is then also, if you come to at the master's level, many of these master programs, they have deadlines that they publish on their web pages. And this depends then really on school to school of, of what are the deadlines. For the PhD program, this is something different. So here, contrary to the American system, so basically we have a, a rolling deadline and uh, or as, as you can say, there's no deadline, so you can start any time. Um, uh, yeah, except, I mean, let's say for, for regular PhD uh, programs, or let's say uh, if, if somebody hires you as a PhD student. Again, so for this Max Planck school, of course, there is a deadline um, that you have to follow, uh, but otherwise you can start, uh, if you just contact a group leader or a professor in Germany and ask them for a PhD position, um, and then he has its own contract that he got some from so German Science Foundation or so. And then you can start with these contracts basically anytime. Yeah. Maybe I would like to add something because I think that's hard to see from international. Since we don't have grants, we have working contracts which we give you. It's really a completely different system. Basically, you're employed, if you're not by the Max Planck, as a researcher. This is really what it is. And you can be employed at any time. And your education that you get your PhD in Germany is something which is much more individual, but you're really working on research topics and the whole, res uh, res uh, the whole PhD is focused on that research work. And I, I think that that is very different. And even if you're within the Max Planck School, kind of you're very much into the research uh, projects and idea of the group. I don't know, but that might help because if you kind of get the mindset a little bit different that you understand, that it's really, you're working on some subjects, it's easier to understand what it means to do a PhD in German. And if I could add as well, um, first of all, because I know there are a number of undergraduates, it seems, um, dialing in today, um, that is, has already been mentioned. Um, a lot of the deadlines for the master's programs tend to be later than in other countries. So we're talking about the late spring and sometimes even the early summer for the coming academic year because the academic year in Germany, again, is, is not necessarily in sync with a lot of countries around the world. Um, and that is often, you know, roughly, uh, this year is a bit of an anomaly, but roughly the middle of October through the middle of February or March, and then middle of April, roughly through the middle of uh, July. So just to keep that in mind. Um, and then to, you know, because sometimes you're already applying now for master's programs, depending on where you are, but the deadlines may not be in sync if you're applying to a university in Germany. And also I think to emphasize what Christine has brought up twice, which I think is very important in terms of how uh, the university system regards a, a, a bachelor's and master's student versus the PhD researcher, that you are technically in terms of your educational experience as a student, 
once you've completed your master's, you have a very different status. You were then legally, when you enter a PhD program, hired as a researcher as part of that PhD program. You're still a student, perhaps, in your minds, but it's a very different structure and a very different expectation in terms of what you deliver uh, and, and what transpires at that level of your career, with the understanding, even in, in the um, structure PhD, that there might be coursework or a curriculum that, as Christine has pointed out, a lot of of, of the foundation, a lot of the, the coursework, that the, the background has already been satisfied before you enter that level of your research slash academic career. Uh, I have one more question for Peter this time. Um, is um, we have, from a more or less statistical point of view, what kind of question is asked to you most in such a situation? I, well, I, I well, I think the first the first of, there are two questions that come very often. If I can uh, give two answers, and one is um, is. Um, and it's not a statistical answer, is, is, is why and are there students like me there and what are they doing with, my, with that international experience in Germany? I think for us, particularly on, you know, when I do outreach in this part of the world, it's really about the peer-to-peer -peer and, and what is it, someone who looks like me, who has my background, who is like me, who comes from a similar um, educational system or country, what are they doing with that experience once they've completed? And I guess secondly, um, and it comes back to what Alejandra brought up in, in her wonderful video testimonial is, how can I afford this? Even if, quote unquote, there is no tuition, there are realities in living day to day. There's a reality in a plane ticket. There's reality in, in buying food, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think that's the two of them is, is you know, what does this do for my, my longer term um, career? And um, equally important is how do I finance this, regardless if the tuition is non-existent? Again, no statistical answers to those, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and maybe a question also again to Alejandra. Um, a bit, uh, if she can, if you can be, please describe a bit, how is your group, uh, what's the comp composition of your group? Is it an international group? And uh, how were you then, um, uh, how, how, what, what was it for your arrival? Did you have help? Did you have any support? And uh, how, yeah, how did you arrive in Germany finally? Sure, happy to answer. Uh, yeah. I was very lucky because I came for a, an international master program. And these two years were really a very nice uh, uh, time not to be alone because I was with other international students. We were in the same situation and we could live this, um, let's call it adaptation time together. It was uh, very rich culturally. And uh, once the program ended, I uh, started, uh, I had started already my research in my work group. And uh, I am there for a lot of time, in my opinion. I am almost now the oldest member in the group. So I, I saw the group changing from time to time. At the beginning, the group was very international. We were half uh, boys, half girls, and half foreigners, and half Germans. It was a very diverse group, thing that I was not used to, because the previous physics groups I was part of, they were mainly guys and mainly from the, from the country, in, in my previous case, Americans. So I was the only foreigner, the only girl, but in this group was different. And then at some point, many of them finished the PhD. So I was, again, the only foreigner, foreigner and, and the only girl. But fortunately, this was just for one year because then came the new wave of, of international students. And again, now we are um, very, uh, gender balance and also very diverse uh, balance is very nice. Okay, thank you. May, so, I, may I add yeah. something? So I would say even a place like, place like Paderborn, which seems very small and local, we have between five and ten nationalities constantly. <laughs> so just, and I think that's pretty normal. So we are very international. 
Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I see that uh, time is running and a lot of questions are still not answered, but I would like to propose that we switch over to the uh, meeting rooms, the individual meeting rooms, and uh, then uh, if the, these unanswered questions could be asked in these individual meeting rooms, and if they don't get an answer, we keep them and uh, try to answer them after that. So we propose to switch to the meeting room. Uh, the link to the meeting room is given in the chat, um, chat has just been given by my colleague Sam uh, uh, in the chat. So please leave this meeting, uh, uh, keep, copy the, the, the link to the next um, room, then leave the meeting and open the, the next room. And there you will then find the individual uh, sessions uh, with, the, um, with the breakout rooms where each of the four speakers will then wait for your answers or your questions. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, as Klaus said, uh, please use the link in the chat to transition over to the breakout rooms. I'll leave this session open for just a few minutes while we make this transition. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs> 